Hi, so it's Carrie Johnston, and I am filming today on the traditional territory of Champagne and Ajac First Nations in beautiful Dakokata Haines Junction. And I am joined by Vanessa Ayer's daughter, and she is joining us from Kwan Lin Whitehorse on the traditional territory of An Kuchin Council and Kwan Lin Dun First Nation. Welcome, Vanessa. Hello, thank you for having me. And so tell us a little bit about who you are as an entrepreneur. So I am a jewelry designer and textile artist, and I work with indigenous sourced furs from throughout the Yukon Territory. And the name of your business? Um, so we actually have two businesses. The, the design business that I own is V. Iyer's Daughter Artist, and the overarching brand that I own with my husband, George Bame, is called Wild Yukon Furs. And how long have you guys been in operation? Uh, the design business has been in existence a little bit longer than the, the fur company. So the fur company started about a year and a half ago, um, but the design business is several years old. I don't even know exactly officially when it started, probably about three years. Mm, and you have a retail operation as well in downtown Whitehorse. And where is that located and how long has that been operational? Um, so we're in the Horwoods Mall. Our current location is right beside the Baked Cafe across the hall from the Collective Good. Uh, but we started out around the corner down the hall beside the passport guy in the tiniest store in the whole territory. It was 65 square feet. That space used to be a stairwell. <laughs> well, and you, and you made it beautiful, didn't you? Well, yeah, it, it was hard to do, but it had good light. So there was that. <laughs> So in your business model, you've kind of got your retail operation and uh, online sales as well. Yep. Is there as any well, other? Wholesale. We do wholesale. And wholesale. Okay. And so what are you learning about your business model sort of in the last couple of months in the pandemic? Uh, the biggest thing I've learned is that uh, as much as I believed that I had diversified by having retail, online, and wholesale, that I really put all of my eggs in the retail basket. Mm, what kind of brought you to that realization? Oh, the part where I had to close my doors and sales stopped. <laughs> that, that was pretty hard to miss that message. Um, and so I think like most of the retailers downtown, when we, especially those of us in the Horwoods Mall, when we decided to uh, close our gates, electively close our gates, because we knew it was the right thing to do. None of us were mandated to close. Um, I think it was, it was a real eye opener that the websites that, that most of us had built, and I can only really speak for myself, but the website I know that I had built was it was there as a formality. It was not highly functional and it ended up breaking. I had to rebuild it completely from scratch. I realized I had a lot of content that was not on the store online. I had to do a lot of photography. The website's still, you know, under construction. There's so many individual items that needed to be photographed and described and counted. And it was a really, really big job, which I knew it would be. And that's probably why I was avoiding it. But this was the time that I had to deal with it. Mm. So as an entrepreneur, how did you, so you, you kind of started to focus on your website, your back end, any other things that you sort of really focused on during the, the closing of your store? Uh, that was a pretty big job initially. So it kind of took all of my time and attention during working hours. And in the beginning, like, I think we were all in a bit of shock about what was going on and probably a little bit of denial. And, you know, what I experienced throughout most of the process was that, you know, it kind of my experience followed a lot of the the typical five stages of grief you know there was the shock there was denial there was anger there was bargaining like i went through all of those phases um and it was when uh during our elective closure that i had taken a bunch of my work equipment home so i could make jewelry from the safety of my own living space um that i started to really feel afraid that you know my my livelihood and my business was in danger and I, I circled the drain for a couple of weeks, felt really sorry for myself. and was really, really, you know, scared about what to do. Um, but I, I started, <clears throat> excuse me, I started feeling really stuck in that place of, oh God, what now? And um, it only took me a couple of weeks to really clue in that that started to feel really bad and I wanted to stop feeling that way. And so I redirected all of that panicked energy into something way more productive. I couldn't control you know, how, how the pandemic was going to impact the territory in terms of, you know, the number of cases and, and the, the long-term effects on, on the local economy. So I knew that I had to do something that would protect and nurture that as best I could while also creating opportunities on a, on a bigger, more global scale outside where the, the pandemic was going to ebb and flow on its own timeline based on, on how, you know, it was transitioning through all the different parts of the world outside of the territory. Hmm. 
It's a really interesting idea thinking about this sort of like following the stages of grief in your own sort of journey as an entrepreneur. Do you have any like reflections about yourself as a, a leader or as, a, you know, sort of your entrepreneurial capacity in that moment? Well, I mean, it was, it's more than just a moment. Like it's been, I don't even know how many weeks it's been. It's been like 12 or 15 or 17 weeks or something, you know, and, and so because it's gone through stages and, and grief as anybody who's ever lost anything, whether it's your, your idea of how you thought something was going to go, or if you've lost a human or you've lost, you know, I've even experienced a house fire and grief manifested in, in a whole bunch of different ways with that as well. And it's not linear. It doesn't follow like a certain process. It just follows a, a certain number of things, you know, elements of that experience and a bunch of them you kind of revisit them until you've resolved whatever your relationship is to those parts of it whether it's the the you know the anger part or the the uh, bargaining part of it you know some parts you'll come back and revisit them until you've resolved that stuff for yourself so um for me when i you know started getting into the darker phases of it I, I tried to be as honest with myself and with others about how I was feeling, you know, because people want to know that you're okay. But I think at the same time, I was getting asked a lot about like, how's the business? How are you doing? And I think even though people wanted to make sure I was okay, I think more than anything, they were looking for me to reassure them that they were going to be okay. You know, and, and when I, I managed to somehow gain the clarity that that's what was truly going on for a lot of people, I just accepted that I would, if I was having a particularly awful day, I would be really honest about it, you know, and if I needed the comfort, then it was usually available to me. But most of the time when I would get those queries, I was in a place where I could offer comfort to those people who were asking. And so it became a really beautiful opportunity to, to lift each other up and remind each other that parts of this feel really bad, but we are mostly going to be okay. Mm. That's a really lovely reflection on Yukoners. Do you have any other sort of insights? What are you learning about your client base, Yukoners, as they sort of as your customer base? Um, I think uh, this isn't a new a new insight into who my my clients are. They're loyal and they're not going anywhere. But I think everyone's just a little bit unsure, and that's okay. I mean, I'm selling for jewelry. It's stuff that most people don't really need. It's a luxury, and if you know, especially when we were on stay at home orders and we weren't going places and we weren't connecting with people aside from zoom meetings where we're all putting on our good earrings and keeping our pajama pants on, there wasn't a big demand for what I was selling, you know? And, and so that's when I, I knew I was forced to innovate and, and I'm more of a, a person who likes to come up with a plan and I'm more action oriented. And so sitting in that place of stuckness and the, Oh God, what now? I had to pay, put that, that anxious energy into something productive. I needed to do something. And so I had to come up with a new strategy for how I was going to grow the business according to the goals that had been laid out, you know, when we began, but the, you know, we'd kind of had to accelerate some of the, the goals, you know, as to when we were going to start achieving them. Okay. So the big question, what, how are you thinking about your business differently with this pandemic? What's, what are you sort of pivoting to? Uh, what I'm pivoting to is targeting a global audience. And so I've been spending the last several weeks working on a PR strategy that has me working in tandem with bloggers, with the big fashion magazines, direct to celebrity uh, promotions, things like that, that are going to bring the product to a bigger audience beyond the territory. The territory has been so incredibly supportive of what we're doing. And we definitely want to keep serving that really loyal customer base. But we also know that the plans that we have for this business are big. And we want to be able to not just buy some Indigenous sourced fur. We want to buy all of the Indigenous sourced fur. And so with, if we're taking in that quantity of material, we need to be producing a greater volume of finished goods and employing Indigenous people. And so if, if that's what we're planning to do, then we need to have a bigger base of people to sell it to. Mm. So as a, to, to lead that sort of thing, do you have any reflections on leadership for some of the, the sort of strengths that you'll need to harness within yourself and, and your partner in business as you sort of like move into this next phase? Um, yeah, you know, we're kind of right now making it up as we're going a little bit because this wasn't something we were planning to do for a couple of years yet, but because of the situation that we're faced with, you know, our, our choice was either to just keep doing what we were doing and potentially have the business not survive because the, the revenue stream had dropped so significantly or do something bigger. And, and so as far as leadership goes, I mean, I'm, it's always just me working in the store. My husband has a full-time job. 
you know, and, and he, he wants to do more. He wants to be involved, but we're both incredibly busy people. So he is my sounding board. He's the person I debrief with. He's the one that I kind of let him know what I'm thinking and, and planning on doing. And he gives me some really valuable insight and challenges me on stuff. If maybe it's the wrong direction or, or just to clarify that I am in fact partnering with the right, um, you know, uh, business connections, whether it's a, a media publication or a model or, you know, different outlets that, you know, he's, he's the sounding board in that regard. Um, but as far as leadership goes, you know, in more of a community based context, because I want to still see everyone succeed and have their businesses do well and, and personally do well. You know, when I have conversations with, with folks, I had a, a, a conversation with a woman just last week who, um, you know, she's in her 20s. She's an incredibly knowledgeable, passionate young woman, and she wants to start a consulting business. And, and she was feeling unsure, and she didn't think that it was the right time. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, I know what you're saying to yourself. You're probably asking yourself, well, who am I to do this? And I said, who are you not to? Who are you not to? The, I, and one of the things that I'm most often known for saying is that the universe is always conspiring in our favor. So if that's true, then I think that there's never a bad time to do something that you are legitimately qualified to do and passionate about, because regardless of what's going on with the pandemic, people need what you do. So is that your advice for sort of aspiring entrepreneurs right now? Absolutely. The universe is conspiring in your favor and nobody can do the thing that you do exactly the way that you do it. And if you are looking at your competition and thinking they've got the market cornered or they're doing it better than me, first of all, they can't serve the entire market and they're not going to be the right fit for everybody. They can't do whatever it is that you do the way that you do it. And the universe needs what you do. Hmm. So have you, uh, what have been sort of some of your, your wellness practices that have been kind of getting you through? You've talked about sort of reflective leadership, um, you know, going home and, and sort of debriefing with your husband at night and kind of getting that reflective leadership conversation going. What else are you doing to kind of keep yourself grounded? Well, I, I already spoke a little bit about, you know, when I have conversations with people, whether it's in the store or in the community, and they're asking me how I'm doing, I think practicing trusting that when people ask, they genuinely want to know. And so practicing honesty in those conversations for me is part of my wellness practice. If someone says, how are you doing? And I'm having a terrible day and I want to go home and get back under the covers and cry till I fall asleep. That's what I'm going to tell them. And if that makes them uncomfortable, we can talk about that, but don't ask me how I'm doing if you are prepared for me to tell you. So, you know, practicing honesty is very much a part of my wellness practice. But aside from that, um, I do afford myself a little bit of Netflix time. Um, <laughs> my, my Mondays are, I, are, they're work days for me, but I'm not in the store. And so I'm often working from home. I'm researching new materials and products and, you know, different outlets that I can, then, that I can send the product out to into the world. But often during those times, I will, that's really heavy mental lifting days. And so I give myself little Netflix breaks. Those are sort of my rewards to get through that hard work throughout the day. Um, and then the other thing that I try to do is eat well and hydrate. Yeah, those just like those like really simple foundations of like, am I drinking enough water? Am I eating good things? Am I it's sleeping really, enough? Yeah, it's I mean, it seems like such a basic, obvious thing. But for me, because I'm so deeply invested in the work that I'm doing, and I enjoy every aspect of it so much, often stopping for lunch is inconvenient. And so unless I have planned ahead and prepared something, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to work right through. I'm going to be hungry. I will need to go to the bathroom and hold it for too long until I'm incredibly uncomfortable. You know, and so just practicing listening to my body's cues. And again, I think that's just another facet of honesty. You're hungry, go eat. You're thirsty, drink something. You know, and, and so just taking, trying to take good care of myself, especially on the days where I don't feel like it, that's been the, the best way to make sure that I'm here in a capacity and I'm able to continue to serve my customers and, and all of my, my retail stores and my own family in the best possible way. I wonder if you could lend us like a little bit more insight as to what it was like when you were, you know, you've talked a little bit about what it was like to close down your store. What was it like to reopen? What were some of the sort of mental challenges and, and also the physical challenges that you faced as a retail operator as you were reopening your, your store? There's been lots of little challenges. Um, one of the things that I've had a, a difficult time with personally is 
you know, I've got this little like hand sanitizing station at the, at the entrance to the store and there's a pleasant little sign that says, please sanitize before entering. And the number of people who I see walk straight past it, like as if they don't see the hand sanitizer. I think we're all pretty used to figuring out where it is in every establishment that we visit. And when people walk right past it and don't use it, I feel disrespected. I feel like now I'm in a position where I have to police people's behavior and I have to tell them you can't touch the products until you sanitize your hands. And, and it's a really socially uncomfortable situation to be in because I, I don't wanna be policing people and I don't wanna be treating adults like they're children. You know, and, and so that's a really delicate thing to try and maintain because the products that I have in my store, they're, they're textiles. I can't sanitize them, you know, and, and now that our borders are open, I'm having to be really careful with people and, you know, just be really gentle and firm. And it's a delicate balance, especially as the week wears on or the day wears on. And I've reminded people all day long, like it would just be nice if people accepted what the restrictions are and followed them. So that's really difficult. Um, another thing is, you know, when I first had to hang the big plexiglass shield in front of my uh, my counter, I find that it's it's an incredibly awkward um, barrier socially. I understand what it's there for, and and I and I believe that it's going to do its job, but it's really difficult to connect with people when you're looking at them through a glass screen. Mm -hmm. Just like we have to do on this this Zoom thing all the time now, right? I know it's it is strange for sure, and I think we're we're gradually getting used to it. But you feel the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are any other sort of like aha moments? Things where you're you know like the way you thought about something has forever changed as a result of the pandemic. Um, I wouldn't say that it's something so much that has forever changed as it, as much as it was a reminder about who I am as a person in business. Um, you know, when, when I started to kind of spiral into the scariest, darkest parts of the early days of the pandemic and being at home and being really fearful about the future of my business, with the help of an incredible therapist, um, I was reminded that of, of my own resilience and strength and ability to adapt. And, and so having those conversations, um, in that process, I was able to get out of my own way. You know, I started to, to, in the beginning, I was, you know, I, I've said earlier, you know, I was kind of circling the drain and it was very sky is falling doomsday thinking and, oh God, it's never going to get any better. And once you start that thinking, that's a really, really hard um, roller coaster to get off of, you know, and, and so by, by having a really pointed conversation with somebody I trust about it gave me the opportunity to just kind of put the brakes on and go, whoa, you're right. This feels bad. It stops right now. Now what do I do? And to create a plan in that moment, you know, in a really supported way um, and to just choose to get off the crazy ride and do something productive and take, take back control over the future of my business. Hmm. So speaking of future, we're sort of entering into this, you know, we're in phase two and talking about phase three for the territory in, in terms of reopening. What are some of your hopes for the economy of the Yukon as we re re reopen? Like, how do you hope we rebuild? Um, it's a funny thing. It's a bit of a double-edged sword. I hope we rebuild quickly. I would love to, to be business as usual. You know, I, I, I refrain from using language that talks about going back to normal because it'll never be that again. And there was so much about it, you know, life before COVID that was so far from normal. So, you know, my, my aim is to achieve something that feels more like business as usual, where our bottom lines are healthy again, and, you know, our, our income is consistent and predictable, and, and we can plan for, you know, the fluctuations of visitors and revenue and expenses, and all of those things are, are what we know them to be, and just in that business context. So even though I would like to see that part restored as quickly as possible. Of course, that means that we are vulnerable in other areas, you know, that we'd be welcoming in visitors and, and already, you know, we're seeing folks coming in from BC and it's a little bit scary. You know, I mean, BC is not COVID free. And I was having a conversation with someone yesterday about like these exemptions that are for family to travel. And I don't understand 
how being the family of somebody in the territory magically exempts you from being exposed to COVID and bringing it in. Like, I, I think there's so much that we still don't know about COVID despite the research, despite, you know, the studies that are being done. And, and, and I've had to stop my media intake because it just is really difficult on my mental health. Um, but I know that we're vulnerable. And so that makes me really nervous. But that said, I mean, given the work that I've done to, um, you know, to try and diversify how the business operates and the markets that we're trying to reach, I think that the business now is better positioned to weather another uh, resurgence. I mean, it'll probably be painfully difficult in its own ways, but I think we're in a better position to not be so, uh, so reactive. I think we'll be in a position to be proactive. Hmm. That's a great place to be. And that's a testament to your skills as an entrepreneur to, to sort of be readying, readying yourself for that possibility and, and really working on that diversification of, of how you do your business. Mm -hmm. Good. Any songs, movies, podcasts, books that are kind of getting you through that you'd recommend? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, I mean, there's so much more that's happening in the world right now beyond just COVID. Um, so in light of all of the Black Lives Matter um, stuff that's going on all around the world, but, you know, that's all kind of situated in the U.S., I very slowly, very thoughtfully made my way through White Fragility, and I plan to read it again very soon because there was so much in there that left me so completely shook that I know I need to read it again really soon. So that it's like watching a great movie. And you know you need to watch it again because all of the subtle stuff you've missed because the big story was so big. So it's a lot like that. So I think that that one's going to stay on my nightstand for a long, long time. But it's almost like a textbook because there's a lot of actionables in there that I think I need to go through the next round with a highlighter and put a lot of post-it flags all through it. You know, so I've got really easy to reference points in the book. So that's a, a big one right now. Um, some of the... Uh, the podcasts I've been listening to, they're pretty varied. There's a couple that are um, that are business specific. I'm just looking at my list of them because I wanted to make sure that I had the names of them correct. So one is mostly, it's just fluff. It's celebrity fluff. It's called Armchair Expert with Dax Shepard. And it's ridiculous. And the podcast episodes are long, but there's hundreds of them. So if I'm, you know, driving anywhere that's usually what's playing because they're long and i don't have to you know pull over and and start a new playlist um so that's been a fun one i also listen to the business of fashion which is a really great podcast for anybody who's working in the fashion industry in any way um they have uh, a couple of different uh interviewers who who um are speaking with fashion experts all around the world but it's been incredible as for somebody who's worked in the fashion industry in one way or another for the last you know 25 30 years to listen to some of the fashion designers who I've adored for my entire adult life and to hear that not only are they just regular people, but that they're experiencing this thing in their own unique way, but also exactly the way I am. And so their decisions that they're making in their fashion business are very similar to the ones that I'm already making in mine. So I'm feeling really validated as a business person, as a fashion designer, you know, that my own personal values are aligning with what the, the industry on the whole is trying to kind of bring things into, you know, after, you know, it's, the fashion industry has exploded into this gross planetary polluter, you know, fast fashion and all of that, you know, and, and the individuals who are behind these big brands, they want something different. They started these businesses for different reasons. And so I'm getting to learn about their insights, the mistakes that they've made, especially participating in fast fashion, and, and kind of streamlining their design process, the manufacturing process, all of the distribution, you know, and I get to learn from, from these designers who are operating at a far greater scale than we are, but, you know, learn lessons through them that can apply to what we're doing. So that's been incredible. Um, I also like The Daily Show because Trevor Noah is smart and informed and hilarious. So that's been a fun one. And I get a little bit of my, like, you know, my global news that way in a way that's really not so depressing. And then there's one other one that I do like listening to. Good. It's a local one. It's called The Horse with Jenny Hamilton and Dan Bushnell. It is sweary, but it's funny. <laughs> I love that one too. I do. That, those are great picks. Any sort of closing thoughts as we sort of end out for today? Oh, goodness. Um, I think, you know, no matter how heavy some of the, the weight 
of the changes that are imposed on us, that's happening to us, how that is probably making everybody really tired. And it's a struggle to feel optimistic. I think even if you can pretend to be optimistic a little bit of the time, you start to believe it. And then it starts to be real and true and sustainable and your reality. So it's a really a case of fake it till you make it in terms of your perspective on things. You know, if it's feeling like you just can't, if you're feeling awful, be honest that you're feeling awful because the people who are checking in on you, they probably are genuinely concerned about how you're doing and they want to make sure that you're okay. So if you're not, be honest. But if you want to feel better, if you want things to, you know, to feel like it's going to feel good again, start behaving as though it, it does feel good again and it probably will. Great advice. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. This is really fun. See you, it Carrie. Bye. Bye.